Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's sermon is from our first lesson, Jacob Wrestles with God, as was what read previously in the service. Please be seated. It's dark out. It's in the middle of the night. One man is alone by a stream, and another man jumps him. They begin to wrestle. They wrestle all night. But then one of them gets injured. They keep fighting, though. Finally, dawn comes, and, and the uninjured man wants to leave. But the injured man doesn't let him. He clings to him and says, I won't let you go until you bless me. After a bit, the uninjured man not only blesses him, but he also changes his name. They then both go their separate ways. Now, this is a strange story. There's unprovoked fighting, wrestling, wrestling all night, asking for blessings, name changes. Very strange, but completely true. As you know, the man was Jacob, and the other man, well, he was more than a man, he was God. At a first glance, you might say, oh, I, I get the point of this story. That's easy. This is about persistence. He was wrestling really hard all night, and, and uh, he was blessed because of it. Well, I think there's some truth to that. But I think there's a lot more to this story than just that. When you look at the context, both the immediate context, as well as the larger context of Jacob's life, you will see that through wrestling, God brings Jacob closer to him. He accomplishes this in us too. He strengthens our relationship with him. In this way, he enables us to wrestle with him and win. He subdues our self-reliance and he graciously lets us win his blessing. So, immediate context. context. Jacob was coming home, but it wasn't the typical homecoming. Now, I have some relatives who have been in Australia for the past five years, and they're coming back in January. So what are we going to do? We're going to throw a big party, a big celebration, invite all the relatives, all their friends, welcome them home. But this wasn't the case for Jacob, because he had left on bad terms with his brother. He had left right after he had stolen Isaac's blessing for Esau. He stole it from his brother, and so his brother wanted to get vengeance. Fast forward 20 years now, Jacob's returning with his wives and family and 20 years' worth of, of income and wealth and blessings. He sent ahead a messenger, and the messenger came back and said, Esau's coming, and he has 400 armed men. So what are you going to do? So Jacob, he's a smart guy. He divided up his possessions into two different groups. So that if Esau would attack one of them, the other one could flee, and he actually kept his family and himself separate from either one of those. Needless to say, this was not a typical homecoming. But that context doesn't tell me anything about why God would come and wrestle with, with Jacob. For this, I think we have to look at Jacob's life as a whole. Let's start from the beginning. Jacob was a twin. His twin brother was born first and came out very hairy. So that's what his parents named him. They called him Harry, or actually in Hebrew, Esau. But Jacob was not far behind. He came out uh, right behind him. In fact, he was holding on to his brother's heel when he was born. So that's what his parents named him. Heel grab or in Hebrew, Jacob. But heel grab grabbing was more than just a name for Jacob. In fact, it sort of described a lot of the things that happened to him throughout his life. The phrase grabbing at the heel in Hebrew is actually an idiom for being deceitful. Jacob repeatedly did things that were deceitful in his life. 
Now, Jacob, the heel grabber, he was like you or me. He, he was a believer, and in general, he trusted God, and he believed his promises. But all too often, specific things went wrong. When something became too stressful, or the stakes were too high, uh, the consequences were, were too great, and he was worried, he would pull people down by their heels. He would deceive them to get ahead. Again and again, the heel grabber used his own trickery, his own conniving, to solve the problem he was facing, rather than leave it in God's hands. And if he saw no other way out, well, he would just flee. So, a few examples from Jacob's life. First, uh, he tricked Esau using hunger against him. Esau had been out working the fields all day. He was hungry. So Jacob made some stew. Here you go, brother. Trade me your birthright for this stew. Well, Jacob wasn't really thinking, or Esau wasn't really thinking correctly, was he? He was too hungry. He said, I want that stew. Give it to me. So he swore away his birthright. Later, Jacob also uh, did something against Esau. He used his father's poor vision to steal the blessing from Esau. He wore an animal skin to trick his father into thinking that he was his much hairier brother. And through this, he stole that blessing from his brother. Then, of course, he doesn't want to face his brother, so he flees. But that didn't end the heel grabbing. It continued with his uncle Laban. His, his relationship with his uncle Laban was really like a chess match. They both kind of tried to heel grab each other or deceive each other. It was like they move after move, it was back and forth. Twenty years of this, and eventually Jacob fleed again without telling Laban. He thought that there was no way Laban would let him go with all his kids and grandkids. So he fled. Finally, on his way home, Esau's coming, 400 men, and the heel grabber, he hatched a new plan. He would bribe his brother with a gift. And if that didn't work, he had a backup. He divided his camp into two groups, like we said before, so that he would at least save half of them. Now, you may think, well, he's just thinking on his feet here. That's the wise decision. If you were in that situation, if, if I was in that situation, I'd do the same thing, right? Well, Jacob had been promised by God when he was leaving the land that he would return to that very land safely, and his descendants would return as well. So, so when the stakes were high, rather than fully relying on God's promises, he repeatedly turned to his own conniving and trickery. Does this sound familiar? We trust in God most of the time, right? I, I know I do. But sometimes, in those desperate situations, we are tempted. Imagine the following situation. There's a family. They're in desperate need for money because the husband just got laid off. While he looks for a new job, the wife is struggling to manage her part-time job as well as take care of the kids. And they can make ends meet as far as putting food on the table, sure. But what about their car payment? What about their mortgage? Well, it happens to be tax time for that, for that family. It's, and they, they're expecting a big refund to come. That'll get us, them through a, the, some of their troubles. But as they look into the numbers, they realize, oh, if, if we just sort of fudge this number and, and fudge this number over here, not, not that much. If we just do a few things, we can like double our refund and cover a few months of payments. And that way, that'll give the husband time to find a, 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 an even better job and get back on his feet. It's for a good reason. They know that God says he will provide what they need, sure. But what about their house? What about their car? All these, all these payments they have to make. How is God supposed to cover that? Now, this is just one example, and I'm sure you can think of more. But under extreme pressure, when the consequences are high, in those de desperate situations, we were tempted to, to cheat, <coughs> to use trickery. And when we have 
No other alternative, oftentimes we flee. This is how Jacob often acted. Trickery and desperation. And once again, on his way back, on his way into his homeland, he was in another desperate situation. So let's see what God does about it. <coughs> on the eve of his reunion with his brother, right after Jacob had put his own plan into action, it was God's turn. God literally, literally wrestles with the heel grip. And they literally wrestle until dawn. God allowed Jacob to contend in this wrestling match. But then he pulls a fast one. He, he uses his almighty power to teach Jacob a lesson. He just touches Jacob, hit, Jacob's hip. He dislocates it. He wrenches it. And in a way, I feel like this is kind of an ironic turn of events. Because really, God didn't play fair in that fight. It was like he brought a gun to a knife fight. He brought his almighty power to that wrestling match. Well, that's not fair. It actually kind of reminds me of the type of thing that Jacob might do. But there's one key difference here. Jacob's trickery was always done for his own benefit. It was a selfish thing. What God did, this was not trickery. He was teaching Jacob a lesson. It was for Jacob's benefit. The heel grabber was injured, and he was now completely at God's mercy. He had no ace up his sleeve. He had no trick to get.